You are listening to Gone But Never Forgotten. Our topics can include, but are not limited to, murder, sexual assault, graphic and gruesome details, and more. These topics are adult in nature and are not meant for everyone. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to Gone But Never Forgotten. This is episode 9 of our podcast that covers the stories of missing persons and unsolved murders. Most of the cases that we cover are from Canada, and this week is much of the same. For this week's episode, we will venture out to Newfoundland and look at a disappearance case that had, and still has, many people completely baffled. But before we get to that, I would be remiss if I didn't give a warm and hearty hello to my lovely wife and co-host, Julie. Hey, Julie. How are you? Hello. I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Going through that horrifying phase of trying to normalize life after our recent vacation. You know how that goes. Yep. Without any further ado, let's head down to the East Coast and learn about Joshua Miller. Joshua Miller was a kind-hearted, self-motivated, and all-around hard-working young man, according to everyone that knew him. Known to his friends as Josh, he had been working two jobs until not long before his disappearance, one at Lowe's and one as a bouncer at the Martini Bar. He had previously been a member of the Sea Cadets, and his long-term goal was to become a police officer and work within law enforcement. Josh had had a rough life early on with his biological parents, and he had lived with and was continuing to live with his foster parents. Friends said that his relationship with them was fantastic and that he had never even called them by their first names. To him, they were always mom and dad. According to reports, Josh had been going through some rough times in the days leading up to his disappearance. Friends said that Josh had recently had a sizable fight with his girlfriend that had him down because she was his first serious girlfriend. The night before his disappearance, Josh went out with friends on the town and he had a great time. Likely the drinking and partying was an excellent release for him from whatever he had going on in his personal life. As such, he decided the very next day that he was in need of a repeat performance and he wanted to go downtown again. Even though there was some stress perhaps on his relationship, friends said that Josh was the happiest that he had been in a long time, as he was in university and working diligently towards his goal of becoming a law enforcement officer. On the night of February 8th, 2013, Joshua left his beloved Dodge Charger at his friend Fergus Dunphy's house for the evening, as he would often do. When Josh would head out on the town, he would often spend the night at a friend's house so as not to disturb his parents by returning home late at night. From there, Josh would head downtown to meet other friends for a night on the town. Fergus said that for the first part of the night, he and Josh were in constant contact. They were texting back and forth. He did note, though, that around 11.30 or 12 a.m., Josh stopped responding to his text messages. That set off some minor alarm bells for Fergus, he said, as it was was unusual for Josh to stop texting with him. Josh was at the Sundance, a bar in St. John's, with his friends having a great night out when he was crossing the dance floor and he accidentally bumped into another patron. Brad Roche, a longtime friend of Josh, who was with him at the Sundance, said that sadly, because of today's atmospheres within bars, one inadvertent bump is not seen as innocent at all anymore. 
Quote, you bump into someone like you will in a packed club and everyone thinks they're tough. There is no such thing as going downtown and having a casual night, unquote. When the altercation started on the dance floor, Josh was kicked out of the club by the staff. Kyle St. Croix, who had worked with Josh as a bouncer at the Martini Bar, said that once outside, Josh was incredibly upset over the incident, and he added that Josh's friends all worked hard to calm him down. Josh was put to the ground for a few minutes to help calm him and control him. But unfortunately, that is when things started to go sideways badly. The guy that Josh had gotten into a fight with inside of the bar came outside at this point, and with Josh prone on the ground, he proceeded to kick him in the head. St. Croix said that it was a solid kick to the head, and that everyone believed that the other guy involved in the fight was in possession of a knife, and they feared that he had intention of doing some real harm to Josh. As such, two of their friends decided to put Josh into a cab while Kyle held off the group of people that wanted to do harm to Josh. The two friends that helped Josh get into a cab were cut in the altercation, Kyle said, and the three stayed behind to file a police report. The belief of the friends was that Josh would get home, sleep off the night, and be better off the next day. Two problems stemmed from that cab ride, according to Kyle, though. First, rather than heading to the place that Josh was likely planning to spend the night, the home of Fergus Dunphy, the cab drove Josh to the area around Stavanger Drive, which was the area that Kyle lived in. Kyle said that if Josh's intention was to spend the night there, his doors would have been locked when Josh arrived in the cab because Kyle was still out at the bar. The second issue is that Kyle knows that a combination of being drunk and a possible concussion after the assault and kick to the head at the Sundance could have left his friend in a very confused, if not compromised, state. There have obviously been multiple theories over the years of what happened next for Josh, up to and including different sightings on the night of his disappearance. We will talk about some of those here. First, some, th- some theories and conversations around the disappearance. The cab driver claimed that Josh got out of his cab and walked into the woods because he did not have money to pay for the cab ride. Friends of Josh have had a hard time believing this because it was not like him at all. First off, he had been in a situation in the past where he was short on cash, but he would simply ask the cab driver to make a stop at an ATM machine. Perhaps more importantly, as we have mentioned, Josh had a strong desire to work for the RNC, Newfoundland and Labrador's Provincial Police Service. Something as simple as ditching a cab fare could potentially end up on a criminal record and cause problems for Josh as far as that goal went. Obviously, there is the fact that Josh was drunk and possibly concussed that could have him even more disoriented than usual, which might have caused him to act out of sorts. One issue that certainly had people upset and worried for Josh's well-being was the fact that it was a very cold night. Temperatures hovered around minus 20 degrees Celsius, and Josh had gone to the bar with a blazer and a dress shirt over a t-shirt. But when he got into the cab, the dress shirt and blazer were gone. So, when Josh exited the taxi, he was wearing only a t-shirt and a pair of jeans. Not dressed for the weather and seemingly without a place to go, Josh would have been in distress not too long after leaving the taxi due to his condition and what he was wearing, combined with the frigid temperatures. You may find yourself wondering why Josh didn't have a cell phone in his possession, as clearly that could have and should have been a lifeline at his disposal. Unfortunately, that one thing that likely could have helped him out by giving him a mode of contact or perhaps a way of tracking him was not on his person. He had left his iPhone inadvertently inside of the cab. As such, when Josh got out of that taxi in the wee hours of February 9th, 2013, that cab driver would be the last person to knowingly see Josh alive. One thing that we found strange when we were researching this case 
was that even when Josh's iPhone was recovered by the police, they could not access texts, emails, or anything aside from call logs, and the only official words seemed to be that those files were accidentally deleted off the phone. After the disappearance also, there were different eyewitness reports as to where Josh may have been seen last. One of the sightings was at the Avalon Mall on Kenmount Road. A second sighting was called in by roommates of Josh's girlfriend, who said that they had seen him behind the property at their location. A third tip would come in, almost two years later, when a man called in that he had seen Josh on February 9th walk over a snowbank and into the forested area nearby near RCAF Road, not far from where he was dropped off by the cab. Police looked into all three locations and also the probability that Josh could have been to all three places in the same night. Two locations were easily within walking distance from one another, and the third was about 10 kilometers away. That meant that all three locations could have easily been visited in one night, but the further location would have likely required some kind of transportation, an avenue that police exhausted resources looking into and they could not find a trace of Josh using any public or private transportation that they were aware of. So what happened to Josh after he got out of that cab? Where did he go? Where didn't he go? Why did he go towards a house that was not his planned destination and was not where he had left his car for the night? So many questions, and sadly, not very many answers. Later that day, on February 9th, Josh did not show up for his scheduled shift at Rona, which was only a short distance away from where the cab dropped him off. This is what really set off alarm bells for everyone, as missing shifts, especially unannounced, was not even remotely close to the norm for Josh. The following day, Josh was officially reported missing. In the days and weeks after Josh's disappearance, Air searches were done by helicopter, whilst police officers and members of the public searched on the ground by walking and horseback. People in the neighborhood surrounding where Josh was believed to be were asked to search garages, sheds, and properties. It was believed that perhaps Josh had taken up shelter somewhere to escape the elements and may be alive and in distress. The search was done extensively by Rover's Search and Rescue, the RNC, and friends and family. Obviously, all to no avail. As is apt to happen in cases like this, theories and rumors, of course, started to grow and spread. Inspector Tom Warren, who was the point man on this case, has cleared up some of the rumored suspects in the case. If, in fact, Josh was hurt or murdered, as opposed to having succumbed to error or the elements. First, in the case of the man that Josh got into a fight with at the bar, Warren said that, and I quote, The person who he was involved with in the altercation has been interviewed. Interviewed at the time he was disappeared and has been subsequently interviewed by my investigative team since. We are satisfied that there is no correlation between the altercation and Josh going missing, unquote. As always, the last confirmed person to see Josh alive was also interviewed in the case, that being the cab driver that took Josh away from the bar. Warren said, and I quote, the cab driver, I actually interviewed him myself, so I am satisfied where he dropped him off. I'm satisfied he wasn't involved. Obviously, one of the things that comes to mind in stories like this is suicide. Did Josh decide that the issues with his girlfriend and the fight that night at the bar was reason enough to do something terrible? Not likely. All of his friends said that Josh was filled with a zest for life and that things, especially the purchase of his Dodge Charger, had him excited for the future. He had resumes in for jobs, and he was working towards many goals. Chris Duke, a friend of Josh, said, and I quote, He had so much enthusiasm for life, it was almost inspiring, and his absence has had such a profound effect on the people who loved and cared about him. 
End quote. In the years that have passed since Josh's disappearance, those that knew him have not given up on trying to find some kind of closure within this case. Fergus Dumphy sums things up perhaps the best as to why most, if not all, believe that Josh met some kind of trouble that night. And I quote, In my mind, there's no doubt that someone killed him. There is no doubt. You just don't go missing in a small town St. John's without any trace of you, without someone being involved, unquote. However, the question that always comes if you decide someone else was involved is obviously who. With Josh, that question is even more perplexing than the disappearance itself. Dunphy says, quote, That's why this is so odd, because everything that Josh did, he did it benevolently. He was just always genuinely happy to help, genuinely happy to be around other people, unquote. Chris Duke still wants to find answers. He said, We try not to let Josh's story fade out of the limelight. This was a guy who had so much to give the world. What he aspired to do, certainly in the last few months that he was around, he was well on his way to attempt to become accepted as a police officer because he wanted to help people. That was Josh by nature. At the time of his disappearance, Joshua Miller was six foot one, and 180 to 185 pounds. He had short, sandy-colored hair and blue eyes. At the time of his disappearance, as noted, he was wearing jeans and a black t-shirt. Anyone who has any information pertaining to the whereabouts of Joshua Miller is asked to contact Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-TIPS or contact the RNC directly at 1-800-363-4334. That about wraps up the story of Joshua Miller, but hopefully we can spread the word and help find answers for everyone involved. So before I want I wrap up the episode, Julie, I just want to ask you, like, do you have any um, hypothesis? What do you think happened here? Honestly, <laughs> I don't know. I find this to be a very confusing case um, because I feel like nothing really makes a lot of sense, which of course is what everyone else is kind of going through. But um, yeah, this one's very sad. I just don't understand what happened. It's definitely heartbreaking. I mean, one of the things that I guess is one of my biggest fears is anything can happen to anyone, anytime. You don't have to be a good person or a bad person or anything but so while reading this through again and like digesting it i kind of have like my own little hypothesis so i'll go out on my little soapbox and i can at least kind of understand how he got where he was so he gets into this fight at the bar and i'm wondering if maybe the friends that put him into the cab you know, in the whole stress of the situation, because they also got stabbed while trying to put him into the cab. I'm wondering if one of them was just like, oh, take him here. Not knowing that he was supposed to go to Dunphy's house. Mm -hmm. They, you know, sent this cab in the direction of the neighborhood of the other friend at the bar, which would explain at least why he ended up where he was. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, we don't know from reading about it and researching how inebriated uh, Josh the was. And the friends. And the friends. Yeah. So maybe that's how Josh ends up where he is. And, you know, whether he paid for the cab or not, or he knew he couldn't pay for the cab, to me, that doesn't matter at the end of the day. No. But I think if I got out of a cab with possibly a concussion or drunk, or both in this case, you know, you think you're going to your one friend's house, you just get out of the cab, the cab drives away, or, you know, doesn't, I don't know what happened there, and all of a sudden you look around and you're not where you think you should be, because obviously he knew he was supposed to go back to his friend's house where his Dodge Charger was parked. So maybe at that point, he wanders off in the forest or wherever he wandered off to 
Um, and I also don't think that it's com- incredibly um, unusual that maybe he did go towards his girlfriend's house um, where her friends saw that saw him in the woods or reported mm-hmm. that they did because that makes sense to me if i'm drunk and i had a fight with my girlfriend maybe i want to see what she's up to maybe i'm um, suspicious or who knows yeah. so i can kind of put him to that point where he gets out of the cab but it's what happens next that just where did he go yeah how have we never found a body yeah um it's well, crazy and i will say uh, you know, to follow up what you're saying is that if he j- did just wander off, like on his own, and no-, no one did anything to him, I do believe like they would have found his body. Yes, like, and most no. likely. Like they, I'm not saying it would, but I feel like there's a better chance of him going. I don't know. I don't know. I just think if he was if he was murdered or killed, there there's more a reason why he still hasn't been found after all these years. You know, if some if he just fell down somewhere or he, you know, frostbite or whatever, at some point they would have found something. Yeah, I mean that. I mean that's definitely true. But like, I guess for me, someone who's had a plethora of concussions, it's kind of like I know how bad that can be. Maybe he was like, oh, like my friend's house is this way, and then between being drunk and being concussed, he just got completely directionally messed up but also when you're drunk you do stupid things he could have fell down a cliff somewhere right but they would have found the body by now i'm not saying he would be alive but i'm saying they would have at least found a body there's definitely ways that you don't find the body but i see what you're saying yeah i'm just saying it seems more likely Mm -hmm. like that's all so and i guess as we're summing up here just like everyone that was a part of this like we have no idea what the hell happened here. Nope, nope. It's so, insane. It is insane. And it's and it's happened pretty recently. Like, 2013 is not that long ago, you know? So if there is anybody out there that has any information, even if you think it's, it's a little thing, oh, it doesn't matter, it does matter because you can get that case going, give somebody um, a, little, a little something to chase after. You know, you just never know. And if you think, you know, you saw something and you're not sure, like, that's okay. Just call the numbers that we, um, we have listed, um, you know, and, and and put out what you know, because you never know what a difference that can make. I think that's Julie's way of telling me that she's done listening to my hypothesis and she's ready for me to wrap this bad boy up because I don't know how to segue into anything else from here. So um, we will again thank you for listening. Um, please remember that you can reach out to us and help us out on Patreon. We can also be reached on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or by email. And do that by all means. If you have any comments, any questions, any concerns, or any show ideas um, for us, even if you just want to say hello, we'd love to say hello back. But without any more to add, I'll just say thank you, and we'll see you all next time on Gone But Never Forgotten.